You fool! Warren is dead. Welcome to Horror Babble. We're back with some classic Benson today, folks. Outside the door. The story first surfaced in Benson's 1912 collection, The Room in the Tower. The story explores the intriguing and often worrying phenomenon of phantom footsteps heard at night. We hope you enjoy it. Outside the Door by E. F. Benson The rest of the small party, staying with my friend Geoffrey Aldwych in the charming old house which he had lately bought at a little village north of Sheringham on the Norfolk coast, had drifted away soon after dinner to bridge and billiards, and Mrs. Aldwych and myself had for the time been left alone in the drawing-room, seated one on each side of a small round table, which we had very patiently and unsuccessfully been trying to turn. But such pressure, psychical or physical, as we had put upon it, though of the friendliest and most encouraging nature, had not overcome in the smallest degree the very slight inertia which so small an object might have been supposed to possess, and it had remained as fixed as the most constant of the stars. No tremor even had passed through its slight and spindle-like legs. In consequence, we had— after a really considerable period of patient endeavour, left it to its wooden repose, and proceeded to theorise about psychical matters instead, with no stupid table to contradict in practice all our ideas on the subject. This I had added with a certain bitterness born of failure, for if we could not move so insignificant an object, we might as well give up all idea of moving anything." but hardly were the words out of my mouth, when there came from the abandoned table a single peremptory rap, loud and rather startling. "'What's that?' I asked. "'Only a rap,' said she. "'I thought something would happen before long.' "'And do you really think that is a spirit rapping?' I asked. "'Oh, dear, no. I don't think it has anything whatever to do with spirits.' more perhaps with the very dry weather we have been having. Furniture often cracks like that in the summer. Now this, in point of fact, was not quite the case. Neither in summer nor in winter have I ever heard furniture crack as the table had cracked, for the sound, whatever it was, did not at all resemble the husky creak of contracting wood. It was a loud, sharp crack like the smart concussion of one hard object with another. "'No, I don't think it had much to do with dry weather either,' said she, smiling. "'I think, if you wish to know, that it was the direct result of our attempt to turn the table. Does that sound nonsense?' "'At present, yes,' said I. "'Though I have no doubt that if you tried you could make it sound sense. There is, I notice, a certain plausibility about you.' and your theories. Now you're being merely personal, she observed, for the good motive to goad you into explanations and enlargements. Please go on. Let us stroll outside, then, said she, and sit in the garden, if you're sure you prefer my plausibilities to bridge. It is deliciously warm, and and the darkness will be more suitable for the propagation of psychical phenomena, as at seances, said I. "'Oh, there is nothing psychical about my plausibilities,' said she. "'The phenomena I mean are purely physical, according to my theory.' So we wandered out into the transparent half-light of multitudinous stars. The last crimson feather of sunset, which had hovered long in the west, had been blown away with the breath of the night wind, and the moon, which would presently rise— had not yet cut the dim horizon of the sea, which lay very quiet, breathing gently in its sleep with stir of whispering ripples. Across the dark velvet of the close-cropped lawn, which stretched seawards from the house, 
blew a little breeze full of the savour of salt and the freshness of night, with, every now and then, a hint so subtly conveyed as to be scarcely perceptible of its travel across the sleeping fragrance of drowsy garden beds, over which the white moths hovered seeking their night honey. The house itself, with its two battlemented towers of Elizabethan times, gleamed with many windows, and we passed out of sight of it, and into the shadow of a box hedge, clipped into shapes and monstrous fantasies, and found chairs by the striped tent at the top of the sheltered bowling alley. And this is all very plausible, said I. Theories, if you please, at length, and, if possible, a full-length illustration also. By which you mean a ghost story, or something to that effect? Precisely. And without presuming to dictate, if possible, first-hand. Oddly enough, I can supply that also, said she. So first I will tell you my general theory, and follow it by a story that seems to bear it out. It happened to me, and it happened here. I am sure it will fit the bill, said I. She paused a moment while I lit a cigarette, and then began in her very clear, pleasant voice. She has the most lucid voice I know, and to me, sitting there in the deep-dyed dusk, the words seemed the very incarnation of clarity, for they dropped into the still quiet of the darkness, undisturbed by impressions conveyed to other senses. "'We are only just beginning to conjecture,' she said. How inextricable is the interweaving between mind, soul, life, call it what you will, and the purely material part of the created world. That such interweaving existed has, of course, been known for centuries. Doctors, for instance, knew that a cheerful optimistic spirit on the part of their patients conduced towards recovery, that fear, the mere emotion, had a definite effect on the beat of the heart that anger produced chemical changes in the blood, that anxiety led to indigestion, that under the influence of strong passion a man can do things which in his normal state he is physically incapable of performing. Here we have mind, in a simple and familiar manner, producing changes and effects in tissue, in that which is purely material. By an extension of this, though indeed it is scarcely an extension, we may expect to find that mind can have an effect, not only on what we call living tissue, but on dead things, on pieces of wood or stone. At least, it is hard to see why that should not be so. Table-turning, for instance? I asked. That is one instance of how some force, out of that innumerable cohort of obscure mysterious forces with which we human beings are garrisoned, can pass— as it is constantly doing, into material things. The laws of its passing we do not know. Sometimes we wish it to pass, and it does not. Just now, for instance, when you and I tried to turn the table, there was some impediment in the path, though I put down that rap which followed as an effect of our efforts. But nothing seems more natural to my mind than that these forces should be transmissible to inanimate things. Of the manner of its passing we know next to nothing, any more than we know the manner of the actual process by which fear accelerates the beating of the heart. But as surely as a Marconi message leaps along the air by no visible or tangible bridge, so through some subtle gateway of the body these forces can march from the citadel of the spirit into material forms, whether that material is a living part of ourselves or that which we choose to call inanimate nature. She paused a moment. Under certain circumstances, she went on, it seems that the force which has passed from us into inanimate things can manifest its presence there. The force that passes into a table can show itself in movements, or in noises coming from the table. The table has been charged with physical energy. Often and often I have seen a table or a chair move apparently of its own accord, but only when some outpouring of force, animal magnetism, call it what you will, 
has been received by it. A parallel phenomenon to my mind is exhibited in what we know as haunted houses, houses in which, as a rule, some crime or act of extreme emotion or passion has been committed, and in which some echo or reenactment of the deed is periodically made visible or audible. A murder has been committed, let us say, and the room where it took place is haunted. The figure of the murdered, or less commonly of the murderer, is seen there by sensitives, and cries are heard, or steps run to and fro. The atmosphere has somehow been charged with the scene, and the scene in whole or part repeats itself, though under what laws we do not know, just as a phonograph will repeat, when properly handled, what has been said into it. This is all theory, I remarked. But it appears to me to cover a curious set of facts, which is all we ask of a theory. Otherwise, we must frankly state our disbelief in haunted houses altogether, or suppose that the spirit of the murdered poor wretch is bound under certain circumstances to re-enact the horror of its body's tragedy. It was not enough that its body was killed there— its soul has to be dragged back and live through it all again with such vividness that its anguish becomes visible or audible to the eyes or ears of the sensitive. That to me is unthinkable, whereas my theory is not. Do I make it at all clear? It is clear enough, said I, but I want support for it, the full-sized illustration. I promised you that, a ghost story of my own experience. Mrs. Aldwych paused again, and then began the story which was to illustrate her theory. "'It is just a year,' she said, since Jack bought this house from old Mrs. Dennison. We had both heard, both he and I, that it was supposed to be haunted, but neither of us knew any particulars of the haunt whatever. A month ago, I heard what I believed to have been the ghost, and— when Mrs. Dennison was staying with us last week, I asked her exactly what it was, and found it tallied completely with my experience. I will tell you my experience first, and give her account of the haunt afterwards. A month ago, Jack was away for a few days, and I remained here alone. One Sunday evening, I, in my usual health and spirits, as far as I am aware, both of which are serenely excellent, went up to bed about eleven. My room is on the first floor, just at the foot of the staircase that leads to the floor above. There are four more rooms on my passage, all of which that night were empty, and at the far end of it a door leads into the landing at the top of the front staircase. On the other side of that, as you know, are more bedrooms, all of which that night were also unoccupied. I, in fact, was the only sleeper on the first floor. The head of my bed is close behind my door, and there is an electric light over it. This is controlled by a switch at the bedhead, and another switch there turns on a light in the passage, just outside my room. That was Jack's plan. If by chance you want to leave your room when the house is dark, you can light up the passage before you go out, and not grope blindly for a switch outside. Usually I sleep solidly. It is very rarely indeed that I wake, when once I have gone to sleep before I am called. But that night I woke, which was rare. What was rarer was that I woke in a state of shuddering and unaccountable terror. I tried to localize my panic, to run it to earth and reason it away, but without any success. Terror of something I could not guess at stared me in the face, white, shaking terror. So, as there was no use in lying quaking in the dark, I lit my lamp, and, with the view of composing this strange disorder of my fear, began to read again in the book I had brought up with me. The volume happened to be The Green Carnation, a work one would have thought to be full of tonic to twittering nerves. But it failed of success, even as my reasoning had done— and after reading a few pages and finding that the heart hammer in my throat grew no quieter, and that the grip of terror was in no way relaxed, I put out my light and lay down again. 
I looked at my watch, however, before doing this, and remembered that the time was ten minutes to two. Still matters did not mend. Terror, that was slowly becoming a little more definite, terror of some dark and violent deed that was momently drawing nearer to me, held me in its vice. Something was coming, the advent of which was perceived by the subconscious sense, and was already conveyed to my conscious mind. And then the clock struck two jingling chimes, and the stable clock outside clanged the hour more sonorously. I still lay there, abject and palpitating. Then I heard a sound just outside my room on the stairs that lead, as I have said, to the second story, a sound which was perfectly commonplace and unmistakable. Feet, feeling their way in the dark, were coming downstairs to my passage. I could hear also the groping hand slip and slide along the banisters. The footfalls came along the few yards of passage between the bottom of the stairs and my door, and then against my door itself came the brush of drapery, and on the panels the blind groping of fingers. The handle rattled as they passed over it, and my terror nearly rose to screaming point. Then a sensible hope struck me. The midnight wanderer might be one of the servants, ill or in want of something. And yet, why the shuffling feet and the groping hand? But on the instant of the dawning of that hope, for I knew that it was of the step and that which was moving in the dark passage of which I was afraid, I turned on both the light at my bedhead and the light of the passage outside, and, opening the door, looked out. The passage was quite bright from end to end, but it was perfectly empty. Yet as I looked, seeing nothing of the walker, I still heard. Down the bright boards I heard the shuffle growing fainter as it receded, until, judging by the ear, it turned into the gallery at the end and died away. And with it there died also all my sense of terror. It was it of which I had been afraid. Now it and my terror had passed, and I went back to bed and slept till morning. Again Mrs. Aldwich paused, and I was silent. Somehow it was in the extreme simplicity of her experience that the horror lay. She went on almost immediately. Now for the sequel, she said, of what I choose to call the explanation. Mrs. Dennison, as I told you, came down to stay with us not long ago, and I mentioned that we had heard, though only vaguely, that the house was supposed to be haunted, and asked for an account of it. This is what she told me. In the year 1610, the heiress to the property was a girl, Helen Dennison, who was engaged to be married to young Lord Southern. In case, therefore, of her having children, the property would pass away from Dennison's. In case of her death, childless, it would pass to her first cousin. A week before the marriage took place, he and a brother of his entered the house, riding here from thirty miles away after dark, and made their way to her room on the second story. There they gagged her, and attempted to kill her, but she escaped from them, groped her way along this passage, and into the room at the end of the gallery. They followed her there, and killed her, the facts were known by the younger brother turning King's evidence. Now Mrs. Dennison told me that the ghost had never been seen, but that it was occasionally heard coming downstairs or going along the passage. She told me that it was never heard, except between the hours of two and three in the morning, the hour during which the murder took place. And since then have you heard it again? I asked. Yes more than once, but it has never frightened me again. I feared, as we all do, what was unknown. I feel that I should fear the known, if I knew it was that, said I. I don't think you would for long. Whatever theory you adopt about it, the sounds of the steps and the groping hand, I cannot see that there is anything to shock or frighten one. My own theory, you know. Please, apply to what you heard, 
I asked. Simply enough. The poor girl felt her way along this passage in the despair of her agonized terror, hearing no doubt the soft footsteps of her murderers gaining on her as she groped along her lost way. The waves of that terrible brainstorm raging within her impressed themselves in some subtle yet physical manner on the place. It would only be by those people whom we call sensitives that the wrinkles, so to speak, made by those breaking waves on the sands would be perceived, and by them not always. But they are there, even as when a Marconi apparatus is working the waves are there, though they can only be perceived by a receiver that is in tune. If you believe in brain waves at all, the explanation is not so difficult. Then the brain wave is permanent? Every wave of whatever kind leaves its mark, does it not? If you disbelieve the whole thing, shall I give you a room on the route of that poor, murdered, harmless walker? I got up. I am very comfortable, thanks, where I am, I said. If you enjoyed listening today, be sure to subscribe to the channel by hitting the red subscribe button below. After doing so, Click the bell icon next to the subscribe button to receive new content notifications. If you'd like to support our work and receive exclusive perks, consider becoming a channel member by clicking the join button below. To support us in other ways, see the video description for links to our Bandcamp and Patreon pages, our merch store over at Teespring, and further information relating to our releases on Audible, iTunes, and Spotify. And until next time.